Welcome back to our live stream at the Gospel Coalition 2019. We're in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, my name is Jeff Robinson. I'm a senior editor of the Gospel Coalition, and I'm privileged to have with me a very dear friend. Uh, uh, over the past few years, I've had the privilege of working uh, at the Gospel Coalition. As he writes for us uh, as, uh, as often uh, as I can get him to, and uh, Dave Harvey. Dave, welcome. Uh, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thank you, my friend. Dave um, is teaching pastor at Summit Church in the Fort Myers, Naples area. That's right. He is author of numerous books, the f my favorite of which is When Sinners Say I Do, and you are writing a sequel to that. Uh, and we're going to wait uh, with bated breath on that. I don't know a lot of the details, but I'm excited. I'll be excited to see it come out. Well, let's talk about pastoral ministry. Um, the theme of the book, uh, uh, um, Faithful Endurance, which we've been working on is releasing now at the uh, at the conference is of course the joy of shepherding people for a lifetime. Now you've been in ministry, pastoral ministry, local church ministry for a long, long time. Tell me um, what. Uh, give me a few reasons why you've loved being a pastor. First of all, how long have you been a pastor? I've been and pastoring for thirty three years. Thirty three years. Yep. You know, we, we, we talk about how difficult it is, how, how suffering is a part of it, following the, walking the Calvary Road with Christ. But tell me, tell me, uh, give me some reasons why pastoring is a joy for you. Well, I, uh, I do live most days deeply grateful to God that he has called me to be a pastor. And uh, there's a number of things that come to mind when I think about the joy of being a pastor. One of the most notable ones is the fact that 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 you as a human being get to participate in mm -hmm. the work of transformation that God is doing in the lives of other people. I mean, when you think about it, this could have happened in any number of ways. God could have... God could have determined that people were going to change by snapping his finger, by sending an angel, by, by any means that he desired. But, but he determined that the church was going to be important. And in the church, the pastors were going to play an, an important role as well through their preaching, through their care, through their friendship, through their humility, through their character. And, and the fact that, that, that I get to participate in helping people get closer to Jesus, to help people to understand God's Word better. Wow, it's like scandalous that I get paid for this, you know? Well, your chapter you've contributed to the book is on the inevitability, the inevitable reality of losing members, of having them leave for good reasons sometimes. Some they move or you know, join another church in another city. And not so good reasons. I leave under duress at times. And uh, if you're a pastor, well, you shepherd a congregation. And a congregation is full of people. And right. those people, some of them will leave. Not all of them will remain with you. No doubt there are pastors watching this out there who, who, who uh, face this all the time. Encourage them. How, how, can you, how, how can you be encouraged in the face of this or stay encouraged in the face of this uh, inevitable reality of pastoral ministry? Yeah, I would just say uh, you're in good company. Um, the experience of having people leave is not new to you. Having people that you're close to leave is not new to you. I mean, we only need to study the Savior for a couple of chapters into the first gospel before we begin to realize that the people around Jesus left him. They departed him. One denied him. Another betrayed him. Um, the, the Apostle Paul, if you read 2 Timothy, the last letter that Paul wrote, it is just rife with descriptions and specific names of people that left Paul. And at one point he says, all of Asia has left me. Um, in the final chapter of 2 Timothy chapter 4, the final chapter that Paul wrote, the final words that Paul wrote, since he wasn't writing chapters, he, he says, at my last defense... Um, no one stood by me. Everyone deserted me, but the, but the Lord stood by me. So, so th there is this sense where, you know, to be called to ministry is to be called to a kind of suffering. But for the pastor, it, the suffering often has to do with these, these relational things, the fact that we, we pour ourselves into people and, uh, and, and, and we fail people 
and, and people fail us. There's a quote that I love that I told you about earlier by, uh, by J. Oswald Sanders. It's out of his book, Spiritual Leadership, where he said, a, a cross stands in the way of Christian leadership. It is a cross upon which the leader must consent to be impaled. And when I think about that, I think about the fact that as leaders in the church, we are called in a role where people are the greatest joys that we encounter. Um, they're, they're some of the most wonderful things in ministry, but they are also the cross upon which we must consent to be impaled. And so if, if, if that's a pastor out there or somebody who's serving as an elder and they're experiencing that, I'd say you're in good company. Men in history have, ex men in scripture experience that, men in history have experienced that. The present day people that you read uh, have all experienced that. This is, this is nothing new. You're simply taking your place in the fellowship of suffering by experiencing it yourself. Well, you and I have both been involved over the years of training men for the ministry, young men in particular, for ministry. And of course, we both know that um, it's impossible to really replicate ministry in a, in a fictional sort of a light way, in the same way that it's impossible to replicate war in basic training. You can, you can give them the tools, you can tell them what it's going to be like, but really until they've been there, it, it's not going to feel like the real thing. How can, we talked about this a bit this afternoon in our panel, how can we better equip or at least warn young men going into the ministry to the reality of, of, of being impaled on a cross that ministry, as one of my friends puts it, is in a very real sense a death sentence? How yeah. can we get them to voluntarily run to the battle? Yeah. Yeah, I feel, I feel for guys that are uh, starting out in ministry these days uh, or, you know, have been in for their first decade because this is a time where there's a lot of high-profile leaders that have fallen or failed. Some of their mentors have, uh, have, have not turned out to be the people they expected. And there is a kind of um, disillusionment that one encounters in, in young leaders. And, and yet, there's no question that in the early church, the role of older leaders was an important part in the development of younger leaders, of the care of younger leaders, older men. And uh, I just want to make sure that that, that that value isn't thrown out in the, in the day in which we're living. You know, I was talking to a, a pastor not long ago. This is a guy that's been in ministry for 30 years. He's got his Ph.D. He, he basically said, you know what I do? I said, well, what do you do? He said, I sit in meetings with younger men and listen to them, <laughs> you know, opine. And that's no slam on younger men. I, I mean, we, we need the vision and values and, and the energy that, that they bring. But the point he was making is that there isn't a sense that he as an older man plays a role. So when I think about helping, when I think about training, when I think about caring for these younger men, these younger pastors, I want to see the role of the older man restored. Because I think in the New Testament, you know, that was a thing. You, you know, you had specific t Timothy, Titus, both have specific instructions for the older men. And uh, I think we have to recover that and make sure that, that those individuals have their place in our lives and in the local church. Well, in this last minute or so, we have in addition, we know that you've endured because of God's grace. We know it's always God's grace when we endure. How have you endured, in, humanly speaking, how have you endured so long in the ministry? Well, my, my well, yes, I, I don't want to quickly move to horizontal explanations without acknowledging the reality of God's grace because there is a sustaining grace that is inexplicable, that does make a difference day in and day out. I would say my wife has been an enormous means of grace in my life. And I would also say that there's been a, a commitment that Kim and I have both had to maintain meaningful relationships, even in each transition to new places, to ensure we're involved in a small group, that there's men around us and women around us that know us so that we can be living this out and experiencing deep Christianity together. Dave Harvey, thank you for joining us this afternoon.